Hello and welcome to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Katherine Seltner in our Washington, D.C. studio. Here's what you can expect in this show. People with intellectual disabilities gather together at the Vatican for a special conference. A bill in Ohio could ban abortions for babies diagnosed with Down syndrome and this. The 2018 March for Life theme is love saves lives. We see firsthand how the March for Life works to save lives all year round. But first, our top story, it's a case that could have major ramifications in the United States. A 17-year-old from Central America, known only as Jane Doe, obtained an abortion after a D.C. appeals court allowed it this week. Since September, the minor has been in federal custody in a Texas shelter operated by the Office of Refugee Resettlement. After finding out she was pregnant, Doe obtained a court order for an abortion, but federal officials objected to transporting her to get the abortion. The American Civil Liberties Union, or ACLU, representing the teenage mother, and pro-abortion groups claim the undocumented, unaccompanied minor is constitutionally entitled to an abortion. But pro-lifers reject this. We maintain the U.S. Constitution does not grant a right to an abortion, not in any case and not in this one. The Texas Catholic Conference of Bishops strongly criticized the ACLU. In a statement, the Texas bishops say, no one, the government, private individuals or organizations should be forced to be complicit in abortion. We spoke with Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton as the case was still developing and the unborn baby had not yet been aborted. You led a coalition of nine states who filed an amicus brief on this case. What is your argument as the Texas Attorney General that this undocumented minor does not have access to an abortion? Well, so she showed up at our border, she was arrested. Our argument is very simple, that she does not have a constitutional right to, a, to an abortion under the Fifth Amendment. If that's actually true, if she somehow does have a constitutional right, then that opens the door to anybody coming to our country from anywhere. And as soon as they get arrested, they suddenly have all constitutional rights. It, it seems to us that opens up a Pandora's box of issues that I don't think we should be addressing. Can you clarify that even further? Because that really is the question at play. Does an immigrant who came here illegally have a constitutional right to an abortion? Can you hit on that specifically? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very clear to us that the, the past decisions by the Supreme Court do not authorize that constitutional right. That right that they gave under Roe v. Wade and it's been further uh, defined over the years does not apply to non-resident aliens, people who are not from our country particularly those who have immigrated here illegally, they do not, they are not subject to those constitutional rights by any account so far. So this would, if, if this is turned, this would be a new constitutional right that we've so far never seen before. You said Texas must not become a sanctuary state for abortions. What do you mean by that? So we feel like we have an interest in protecting our state because we don't want, since we are a border state, obviously there would be many people, if this were a new constitutional right, that would come to our state for abortions and suddenly we would be a you know basically a sanctuary state for abortions for anybody in the world that decided they wanted to have an abortion and certainly our state doesn't want to be in that position it's it's an obvious problem for us going forward if somehow a court finds a constitutional right here just to bring even more clarity to this case if this young woman was not in the custody of the government say she had an american sponsor family would she have access to an abortion in that case she might if she had somebody else that was sponsoring, but the, the, the argument here is that she's, she is in the custody of, of the federal government, and so she certainly does not have that right. It's a whole other question if she she's, uh, has a sponsoring family and she's here you know, in some legal capacity. There could be an argument that maybe she does or she doesn't. That's a whole other question that we're not addressing with this case. And to be clear about American tax dollars, would American tax dollars cover the abortion in this case? Is that procedure funded by Americans? So in this case, supposedly there are private payers who are willing to pay, but we, my guess is as soon as they find a constitutional right, the next case will be a tax-funded abortion case, and we'll be arguing about whether taxpayers should be paying for abortions for people who enter our country illegally from anywhere in the world. I, I can almost guarantee that case is the next case. There are two patients in this case, the young woman and her unborn child. We're speaking about this woman's constitutional rights, but 
are there any legal protections in place for her child? Yeah, you know, we have, we have legal protections certainly in the state of Texas about, you know, care. We also have legal protections that it, it, you, after 20 weeks you can't have an abortion. So all of those would still apply in this case. But as I suggested, we don't feel like we should even get there because we don't think those laws actually apply to her. The ACLU and its abortion allies quickly got involved in this case. What do you believe is their ultimate goal? Is it for this young woman to become the international Jane Roe? I think that's kind of where we're headed. I think that's, I think you stated it in a very interesting way, but that's certainly what it appears to seems like the case that they want to bring forward to open the door and the floodgates would be certainly floodgates for anybody in the world to come to the United States for an abortion. And that's certainly, I, I would guess, uh, something that most Americans don't want to be a part of funding, at least. This young woman is believed to be about 15 weeks pregnant. Texas, your state, prohibits most abortions after 20 weeks. In this remaining time span, what kind of action are you expecting and are you prepared to take in the courts? Well, so we're, we're actually going to be in front of the Supreme Court, we would guess, in the end. We've got to obviously wait for an opinion by the, the Court of Appeals in, in the District of Columbia. So we're waiting on, the, on that decision. That our case was argued on, on Friday. And so when we get a decision there, my guess is that either side, whoever loses, will, will uh, apply for a cert petition with the United States Supreme Court. Whether that's granted or not, who knows? So it could be that the, the decision is made by the, the D.C. Circuit. It could be that it's a U.S. Supreme Court case very soon. It's continuing to draw more and more attention. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, thank you for your time. Hey, thank you for having me on. This is a very important issue. I appreciate your coverage. For a reaction and continued analysis, we turn to our pro-life expert. Mallory Quigley is Communications Director for the Susan B. Anthony List. She joins us now. Mallory, thanks for being here. Great to be here. We as pro-lifers uphold that the Constitution does not grant a right to an abortion. And many pro-lifers make the argument the unborn child has a constitutional right to life. Can you speak more to this debate? Sure, yeah, well, nowhere in the Constitution does it appear that there is a, a right to abortion. And I think that this, this situation that we're in right now just goes to show um, that the Roe versus Wade decision has gotten us into such a predicament. Who would have imagined in 1973 that we would now be arguing whether or not um, a young woman who has come into our country illegally has a constitutional right to end the life of her child, no less, and that our government should be forced to oversee this and be a part of it. So I think that it really just goes to show like this is one of the many um, evils that Roe versus Wade has sowed in our nation. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton told us this case could open the floodgates for more people to come to the U.S. for an abortion. What do you see as the major ramifications of this case? Yeah, well, that absolutely is a huge concern. I mean, really, the floodgates have sort of already been opened. The U.S. is only one of seven countries to allow abortion on demand after five months, and this mm -hmm. young woman is certainly approaching um, during this time period has mm -hmm. been approaching that that marker um, but absolutely you know you talk about young women that are coming into this country illegally there are many reasons that cause people to to cross the border um, under cover of darkness it's very it's a very dangerous journey for one to make we can imagine that there are young girls women that have potentially been trafficked this is just not a good situation for the United States to be set up as a place where um, people that are trafficking vulnerable young women can come and bring them for their abortions. And it's not the compassionate response. You're seeing language from abortion lobbyists saying things like this young woman is being held hostage. Mm. How do you respond to that kind of language and what do you think really is the goal here they're going for? Mm. They, this is absolutely a scare tactic mm. um, and it, it's supposed to distract from the reality that there are two people involved in this situation. Mm -hmm. There was a beautiful article in the New York Times this week, the New York Times no less, mm -hmm. about do how doctors operate on the children inside the womb for things like spina bifida, for example, and they called it the patient within a patient. And that's what we're concerned about as pro-lifers. Can you speak more to what true compassionate care should look like for this woman and how that's not abortion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that whenever there's a circumstance where a young woman is seeking an abortion out of fear, which could be the case here, as we've seen 
from past articles that she f is fearful of abuse uh, in her home country, abuse from her family. We need to address the root of the problem. There are so many crisis pregnancy centers, pregnancy resource centers across this country, many in Texas and nationwide, who have been for decades responding to women in need in a loving and kind manner, saying, let me help you address the root cause. Let me help you um, choose life for your child or help you to find um, an adoption partner or, um, or just to get at all the, the circumstances and, and let's address all the circumstances. Mm -hmm. That's what compassion is, really offering true freedom to make the choice for life. Absolutely. That's so well said. Mallory Quigley of the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you. My pleasure. The case surrounding the undocumented teenage mother needs our prayers. We know abortion is not health care, and we know putting a young woman through an abortion is not compassionate. But that is exactly what the ACLU, NARAL, and Planned Parenthood are pushing. As the Texas bishops have said, government officials are to be commended for defending the life of an innocent unborn child. Pro-lifers, here is this week's important call to action. We need to pledge our prayers for this young mother and her baby. And we need to pray for those at the Department of Health and Human Services and surrounding agencies who are advocating for life. We know prayers can make a difference, so please join in this spiritual bouquet. You can make your prayer pledge at ProLifeWeekly.com. That's ProLifeWeekly.com. We'd love to hear how you plan to pray for this young woman and her baby. You can leave a short description and tell us your name and email. Your prayers, your voice are so important in this. Please follow this week's call to action, join the spiritual bouquet, and share the prayer pledge with your family and friends. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Turning now to more pro-life news, we go to EWTN's Valeria Longhi with the top headlines. Sentimos el deber de iluminar sobre la ideología de género. That is Archbishop José Rafael Quiroz Quiroz explaining why Costa Rica will hold its second March for Life and Family. The Archbishop explained the Costa Rican Bishops' Conference wants to shine light on the gender ideology that is colonizing the country. The March for Life and Family will be held on December 3rd at their capital, San Jose. Abortion in Chile has recently been legalized to be performed in certain circumstances, but the upcoming presidential elections in the country is paving a way for pro-life politicians to push back and eliminate the law. One outspoken politician is Chilean independent presidential candidate Jose Antonio Cast, who formally announced in a 23-page document his pursuit to end the abortion law. He also criticized his pro-life opponent, former president and current presidential candidate Sebastián Piñera, saying it's not enough just to say the law will be modified. Hi, Pope Francis. Thank you for your kind leadership. Pro-life advocate, speaker and actress Bridget Brown addressing Pope Francis ahead of last week's Vatican-sponsored conference dedicated to persons with intellectual disabilities. The event drew more than 420 people from all over the world, including those who work in catechesis and people with disabilities. During his speech at the event, Pope Francis said the church must be a place of acceptance. Our Holy Father said our response to the common eugenic tendency must be a true, concrete, and respectful love. Even though his speech was only about 10 minutes long, Pope Francis stayed over an hour to personally shake hands with the participants. Valeria Longhi, EWTN, Pro-Life Weekly. Thank you, Valeria, for those pro-life headlines. As we begin to wrap up October, we want to acknowledge this month is Down Syndrome Awareness Month. Down Syndrome is a condition in which a person is born with an extra chromosome. In the United States, 67 to 85 percent of unborn babies tested with Down Syndrome are aborted. That is why a group of Ohio lawmakers have recently introduced the Down Syndrome Non-Discrimination Act. The bill would ban abortions when parents want to abort their baby either partially or entirely based on a Down Syndrome prenatal diagnosis. Convicted abortionists could be charged with a fourth-degree felony, be stripped of their medical license, and be held liable for legal damages. The woman would face no criminal liability. Ohio State Representative Derek Marin of District 47 sponsored the state's House version of the Down Syndrome Non-Discrimination Act. He joins us now from Toledo, Ohio. Thanks for being with us. Catherine, it's great to be with you. First off, why did you want to sponsor this bill? 
Well, I believe we need to create a culture of life in Ohio where all unborn children's lives matter. And I don't believe any child should be discriminated against because they have a genetic condition or a medical condition. Um, I believe all children should be treated the same and that we, by our law, should protect all those children. How would this type of an abortion ban be implemented? Couldn't an expecting couple simply say they are seeking an abortion for a reason other than Down syndrome to get around the ban? Sure, the bill specifically addresses the physician. The bill prohibits a physician um, from uh, conducting an abortion based on the belief or diagnosis uh, that the mother is having an abortion based on Down syndrome. It also makes them put down in a written record that an abortion was not performed due to Down syndrome. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, significant penalties for a doctor that would, um, you know, falsify that information. So I, I do believe that uh, physicians and the medical community would follow the law. Families who learn of a Down syndrome diagnosis might feel overwhelmed, not sure of what life will be like for their child. What kind of supports does your state provide to families who have children with Down syndrome? Well, our state supports, uh, supports Down syndrome, the Down syndrome community a lot. Uh, the medical community has made great progress uh, caring for children with Down syndrome. Uh, the life expectancy of children with Down syndrome has skyrocketed over 60. Uh, many uh, employers are now employing uh, individuals with Down syndrome. And, you know, people with Down syndrome have so much to give back to the community. They're such loving individuals, and we need to accept them, we need to protect them, and we need to continue to support uh, families uh, with children with Down syndrome. Down syndrome can result in intellectual and physical delays and disabilities, but as you just mentioned, it sounds like they can really contribute to society. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, one of the uh, most important aspects of this legislation and this whole issue is how many parents are waiting to adopt children, but not only adopt children's, Catherine, but adopt children with Down syndrome. Mm. We have several adoption agencies uh, in Ohio that have waiting lists of parents who want to adopt and are willing to adopt children with Down syndrome. Uh, so many parents want to wrap their arms around uh, a new child, a child that may have um, some perceived uh, disabilities or challenges, but they're ready, they're ready to love them, they're ready to nurture them, and they're ready to bring uh, those children into their home. In your testimony on this bill, you stated your personal experience has shown individuals with Down syndrome are truly treasures. Can you share some of that personal experience? Well, I've had the opportunity to interact with many people in my community with Down syndrome. Uh, I was at a restaurant uh, the other day and several people with Down syndrome were working. They were happy. Uh, their employers were happy that uh, they were working for them. They were doing a great job. And Down syndrome, people with Down syndrome are so loving. They're caring. Uh, they have a lot to teach us and they have a lot to give. But for, Down, for people with Down syndrome to be able to give, they have to be given the opportunity to live. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do. I want Ohio to be a safe haven uh, for people with Down syndrome, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put it in codified in law uh, that uh, Down syndrome is not a death sentence uh, upon diagnosis in our state. Ohio State Representative Derek Marin, thank you for your time. Great to be with you. When we come back. Love is it's basically the DNA of the pro-life movement. We see what it's like to be the head of the March for Life. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Il mondo, la chiesa, hanno bisogno di giovani coraggiosi. In a video message Pope Francis sent to Canadian youth last week, our Holy Father reminds young Catholics to be courageous so that no one is rejected or deprived of human dignity. Welcome back to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Catherine Seltner. In this week's Speak Out segment, we bring you a story that really shows how far our world is getting from basic truth and biology. According to news reports, the UK government objected to the term pregnant woman in a United Nations treaty. The government claims the term pregnant woman excludes transgender people and that it should be replaced with the phrase pregnant people. 
Yes, really. A major government is pushing back on one of the most basic facts about life. To anyone in the UK government who missed the where do babies come from lesson, here's a refresher course. If a woman's fertility is healthy and she's of reproductive age, a woman produces eggs. When an egg is fertilized by a man's sperm, the woman can grow and give birth to a baby. Miriam Webster defines woman as an adult female person and defines female as being the sex that bears young or produces eggs. In other words, to be pregnant, you must have female reproductive organs, which means you are a woman. I could go on and on with these definitions, but using our shared human experience and common knowledge alone, we know it is a woman who gets pregnant and gives birth. I can guarantee every single pregnant person you've ever known has been a woman, including your mother. It is not offensive. It is the truth. And we cannot allow our world's social confusion to get in the way of truth. If you erase woman from the pregnancy equation, there would be no pregnancy at all. Remember, there is something you can do to counter today's culture of death. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Pledge your prayers for the undocumented mother, Jane Doe, in Texas and for her child. The March for Life is the largest pro-life event in the world when people converge onto Washington, D.C. to peacefully protest legalized abortion. But the march's work goes beyond this massive January event. That's clear, as we got a glimpse of what a day in the life is like for the March for Life president. Here's this week's pro-life focus. I introduce Jeannie Mancini, president of the March for Life. After March for Life founder Nellie Gray died in 2012 at age 88, Jeannie Mancini was appointed the group's president. She was less than half Gray's age. There's a great saying in the Catholic Church that it's only by standing on the shoulders of giants that um, we can understand, you know, truth and reality and what have you. This pro-life leader never would have expected her role today. After studying psychology in college, Mancini then worked with abused children with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. I was really grappling deeply with the question of the value of life. Would it be better if some people weren't born? Because they were born into such difficult scenarios of abuse, things that you'd never want your worst enemy to go through. And interestingly, God brought me to a really different place on that. And I came to the realization that every life is a gift, that every single person has human dignity. Mancini continues to rely on God in her work today and on the help of the many saints the Catholic Church offers. St. Gianna Beretta Mola, just incredible, so I'm always asking for her intercession. I've got her picture, you know, right by my desk. Um, St. Teresa of Calcutta, and I could probably go on and on, but that would take up the whole show. <laughs> so. Even though the March for Life in Washington, D.C. is the largest pro-life event in the world, the staff is small. With only a handful of full-time employees, each member needs to give their all for the March's year-round work. I'm asked so often, what do you do after January? But it's, it's a pretty constant pulse around here, I would say. So um, we're very engaged in legislative activity. We also do um, quite a robust social media campaign year round. There's always something happening in DC related to pro-life work. The day we followed along with Jeannie and the team was an especially busy one. So we'll just thank them and say, stay tuned because, you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. The pro-life group was prepping to announce the March's 2018 theme in a Capitol Hill press conference. With reporters and Hill staffers expected to attend, Mancini reviews the theme with her publicist on the ride over. We tried to, to choose a theme that we think is the most cutting edge in terms of what the movement needs and um, what people need to hear to be inspired to go home and, and make a difference to build a culture of life. And after some final preparation and much anticipation. So drum roll. <laughs> this year, I'm excited to announce that the 2018 March for Life theme is Love Saves Lives. The theme matches Jeannie's noteworthy passion and optimism. Love is it's basically the DNA of the pro-life movement. And her high hopes for the future. If every marcher responded to God's call to them, responded to their potential, abortion would be ended that year. I'm convinced of it. If you want to keep up on the latest March for Life updates and start preparing for the January 19th DC event, go to marchforlife.org. 
That's it for this edition of EWTM Pro Life Weekly. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach us anytime with questions, ideas, comments at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. I look forward to seeing you here again next week. And remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.